A week from tomorrow, the January 6th committee will hold its first of eight public hearings this month after nearly a year's work, more than 1,000 interviews, and despite massive Republican obstruction. In particular, from House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy and four other Republicans, they've refused to comply with the committee's subpoenas for information. My position has not changed on this committee. It's not valid because Republicans were not allowed to appoint anybody. This is purely Pelosi appointed. Now, what Leader McCarthy said today is not true. Speaker Pelosi rejected two of McCarthy's appointments. One of them, Jim Jordan, is one of the five who've refused to comply with the committee's subpoenas. She gave McCarthy the option to replace the two who were rejected. He declined and pulled the three members who were accepted. Several Republican members of Congress did end up working with the committee, and a CNN exclusive, one of them, joins me tonight, former Republican Congressman Denver Riggleman of Virginia. This is his first interview since serving on the committee as a senior technical advisor and leaving it. Uh, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has been a key source of information as he provided thousands of text messages to the committee. How valuable has the information he provided been to uncovering how extensive the efforts to overturn the election were? Yeah, and thanks for having me, Anderson. I think, uh, you know, as my team was the first to actually see the Meadows text messages when we were able to link the numbers and the names together after we got the thousands of text messages. So to look at it, it's almost a roadmap uh, to what happened. And a lot of the texts haven't come out. Thankfully, I think the committee is going to do a great job of linking those text messages to the other interviews and data that they have. But I think what people are going to understand about the Meadows text messages is how horrible they are. I have to tell you this, Anderson, when I first saw them, uh, my bemusement turned into horror pretty quickly when I saw some of the language that was being used in there. I actually had to get away from the computer a couple of times as I was looking at these text messages. And, you know, starting November 3rd, November 4th uh, in the Meadows text messages all the way to the end, uh, it is a roadmap, and I would have to say at this point, I think Mark Meadows is the MVP uh, for the committee. Uh, I think they should pay him. Um, the, the data that we got from there actually allowed us to really structure an effective investigation. I mean, you mentioned this, but many of the text messages that Meadows provided were to phone numbers that weren't attached to a name. Who was Meadows communicating with, and, and how did you figure that out? Well, you know, I was fortunate when I was brought on as a senior technical advisor, you know, Congressman was just my cover, Anderson. You know, my background was in the intelligence community and Department of Defense for 20 years. And, you know, I did a lot of telephony analysis, geolocation and things like that in my life. Uh, I was actually trained at NSA, but I was also trained with uh, Air Force Special Projects. And so when they brought me on, Liz and the Pelosi team, when I interviewed, they understood that I had this background that was very unique, you know, for somebody in Congress. So I, w I wrote the contracts uh, for the uh, phone record team and the contract for the open source intelligence research team. Uh, put the funding together because I was a CEO. I did do program management for those type of programs. And I was able to handpick those teams that support mm. three-letter agencies. And right now, I would say that without those teams, I think they're the real heroes of this investigation. Uh, you know, I don't like to use their names, but if I, if I can talk about, you know, Golf Bravo and Mike Tango, right, and those type of individuals that are out there right now, another Mike Tango, right, uh, all these people that have been helping with these contracts and with this analysis, uh, they're some of the best individuals I've ever met. And the fact is, we had to hand select these teams, people who had supported three-letter agencies, and then build an unclassified lab that tried to mimic a classified lab. And we were able to do that on a pretty limited budget, and I'm very proud of them. But, uh, you know, si linking those numbers to those names are specific types of databases. I'm not going to mention those names right now. Uh, but we were very effective in helping the committee not only linking names to numbers, thousands of them, uh, we were also very effective in helping with writing the subpoenas for preservation records, for call detail records, and, and, and also um, actually identifying other, I would say, other high-value assets, right, that were in the ecosystem at that time. You, you said right before that you were so troubled by what you saw that you had to step away from your computer. What, what do you mean? What, what, what did you see that was so troubling? <laughs> I think... Um, you know, I think, you know, I'd said before, you know, you, you start with these people can actually believe these things. But I was I was looking at former colleagues that were sending horrific things, um, you know, whether it was, uh, I would say, foreign disinformation videos from YouTube or Rumble or Parler. Uh, I was looking at things that it almost looked like it was a holy war uh, within the text messages themselves. And it was these are sitting members of Congress that, you're talking about, you know. That's correct. Sitting in former members of Congress, 
You're talking about Trump appointees. You're talking about fundraisers and donors. You're talking about group texts. And, and you know, I would get something, um, Anderson, that might be as crazy as, you know, the orcs are storming the bridge, right? And we need to have some wizard spells to cast on them to, you know, stop the, you know, the, the monkey birds from attacking us. And I would have somebody high up, you know, very high up in the Trump administration say, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if that's true. And it wasn't just what they were saying. It wasn't just this sort of spiritual warfare coupled with, you know, QAnon type of, um, you know, religiosity and types of conspiracy theories. It was the fact that nobody pushed back or they would tacitly agree or they would say, this is the plan that we need to do. And the names that you're seeing out there right down the news that's reported, there's some amazing open source intelligence researchers, things like that, that people can see on Twitter and other posts. Those people are in these text messages. And when you see them, Anderson, it is a roadmap but it also is something that you you really have to try to get your arms around. And I've read those text messages so many times, you know, you almost, you almost feel like you're reading a fantasy novel. And I think people need to understand that the committee has an amazing challenge to try to get around the horror of those text messages and some of the things that you see on there. And, and it is horror because these are people that are serving our government. And you can see, you know, almost QAnon and other conspiracy theories had inundated the Republican Party all the way up to the top levels. And, you know, some of those were like the Jenny Thomas texts and things like that. It's it's absolutely stunning that these individuals in a position of power are making policy. You also found out that Meadows and the people he was texting with would move their conversations to encrypted platforms. I know I remember seeing one that, that you know, we said, OK, let's I'm sending you something on Signal. You had no way of accessing those communications, right? I mean, will we ever know correct. what transpired on Signal and elsewhere? Unless they've given up voluntarily. And I think the committee has been very effective in identifying some of those individuals that were willing to cooperate. So some of those Signal chats were given up voluntarily and also other text message chats. And, you know, what's interesting, Anderson, is, you know, my biggest fear to talking to you is, is, is not just making sure, you know, I, I don't uh, anger too many people since I seem to have a propensity to do that based on data. Uh, but it's also that I don't want to give away how we do things too much because I'm worried. Um, the, the thing that I have a lot of concern about with the committee is that we're giving away almost a playbook or a new, what we say in the military, tactics, techniques and procedures or TTPs, that we're giving something away based on this report. Um, so the things that we have done, how we've identified individuals, how we've linked certain types of data, uh, I believe is so robust that I'm almost afraid mm. to go too deep into how we find these things. But right now, we're close to 20 million lines of data. Uh, Anderson, this is the biggest data exercise and effort in the history of Congress. And um, it has been, it's been a hell of a thing to try to get our arms around. But again, I think the committee is going to do a good job moving forward and trying to link all that data. I mean, wh you, what you're describing sounds like people within the government talking about a coup of, a, of, of our democracy. You know, Anderson, uh, you know, when I first started this, you know, I was afraid to use that term because I wanted to see the data. You know, the the term I like to use was coup like movements. Right. It's it's a military thing when we had we would make fun of people who said they were working, but they weren't work like movements. Right. They were just talking. But looking at the interconnectivity between people, what we call the centers of gravity and telephony analysis. So many people are communicating. Uh, the link analysis is absolutely massive. And what the committee has to do, because we're limited in our authorities, there's some disinformation out there that, you know, we can see content, right? Or we've, we've got geolocations for telephones, things like that. We don't. So we had to use unclassified data platforms to try to recreate and find that type of data. So we are limited in what we can see. But what we can see is absolutely damning. And the committee has to actually push all those nodes together, all those little endpoints that are people or organizations, they have to link that with the thousand interviews that they did, emails that they have, things like that, that I've been able to see, uh, but also with the massive amount of data we've been able to aggregate and analyze. And I think that's very important for people to understand that the challenge for this committee, they might not cover everything because we have such a short amount of time, but Anderson, I would say we need another year to actually look at the amount of data that we have to, to see how deep this actually went. I mean, based on what you've seen, can you say how high you think this effort to overturn the election goes? Does the committee have information about the former president's, uh, you know, involvement that isn't already known? I don't want to take the committee's thunder, but I'll tell you this, which I think the American people should watch out for. And I can actually refer to the Meadows text messages. When you see text messages that have all three branches of government involved, and, and the one that really bothered me was the forwarded text from Jenny Thomas to Mark Meadows uh, from Connie Hare, who was a chief of staff for Louis Gohmert. You know, we had the wife of a, a sitting Supreme Court justice. We had the chief of staff of a congressman, and the chief of staff of a president on one text message. When you talk about horror, when you talk about concern, 
when you talk about seeing the type of language that they're using, uh, this fantastical language, this call to arms, this is our Omaha beach. When you see, th I, you know, the, the five most chilling words was the first text, I hope this is true. And you're talking about Gitmo and you're talking about things like that at the top levels of government. I would say that the committee is going to have the ability to see what's going on there. And I guess um, it's just so troubling because if I see people just talk about opinions or things like that, the issue is that these were policymakers at the top echelon, the top levels of government, and the committee has to decide this. And the, pe the American people have to decide this when they see the committee's evidence. Number one, was President Trump just sort of in the current, a willing participant, where he was led by others by the nose and really didn't know what was going on? Number two, is it somewhere in the middle? Right, where he had situational awareness. He sort of knew what was going on, sort of had plans, and sort of was just a, a willing participant, right, and had some control. Or number three, the last one, was he really part of the command and control infrastructure, and how deep does that go, and was he a willing participant? And I think the data is going to be very compelling from the, from the committee, but I think it's up to the American people after, after that's presented to come up using facts, not fantasy or opinion, using facts on, uh, on what they think the culpability of the president is and the people around him. Denver Riggleman, I appreciate uh, your talking to us tonight. Thank you. I look forward to more. Thank you so much, Anderson. Got a live up.